Hi, Gadget UK here again. A super exciting moment for me because we have an A4040 to work on. I'm just moving the bits off the top, I'll show you those in a sec. Uh, yeah, so as you can see from the front badge, it's a 4040. I'm assuming it's still got the 40 CPU uh, card in there. Um, I'm guess I think you can change it over. I'm pretty sure you can. We'll have a look inside. So just zooming back a bit, you can see it's got a CD-ROM fitted. You've got a, a lid lock there, I think. Is that for the lid? Presumably it is. Um, floppy drive. The interesting thing, and I never noticed this, my friend Albert used to have uh, an A4000, obviously when they were new, so it wasn't yellowed on the front like this. Uh, you could retro bright that. I think actually if I owned it, I'd probably be tempted to do that. Uh, because it's the only piece, you know, the buttons and the drive look okay. It's just this bit here. But the thing I never noticed is this. It looks like there's an extra little piece of plastic there. Uh, so maybe you could have a, you know, a, like a, almost like a full height, three and a half inch uh, drive there, maybe for a tape drive or something like that. I'm not sure what, what would have been higher than the height of the drive uh, plate there on the front. So along with this, he's included some chip quick flux, which is amazing, because uh, it's pretty pricey stuff and I am very low. I needed to order some, it's on my list of things to do, so that will be super useful for the things we need to do to this. Uh, he's included uh, some stuff from the Amiga kit here. So we've got, as you can see, you know, the one of the audio connectors there, there's the other one. Apparently the audio connectors are not good. Uh, memory modules, presumably it's got no memory in it at the moment. Um, not sure what this is. I'm not sure if it's one IC or more, but you can see some ICs or an IC there on the uh, static you know, on the static phone. And a cap kit here from Amiga Kit. You can just about see the SMD caps in there. So this has come from Cathers, one of my patrons. Hi Chris, thanks for offering to look at this computer. It has a few issues that I've already mentioned, but I list them again. It doesn't always boot, sometimes it goes to a black screen with some graphical uh, graphics corruption, doesn't attempt to boot. Other times it just boots, no issue. If it keeps black screening, then I switch it off and press uh, several times on the motherboard and the area between the mouse port and the battery. Uh, this often uh, lets it boot and switch back on, so we've got uh, you know, a black screen problem there, booting problem. Uh, the mouse port is unreliable, I'm not going to read all that, you can see the text there if you want to read all that. Uh, there's no sound output, so yeah, we've got that's why we've got those uh, new sound connectors. But it could be bad uh, solder points and things, corrosion, bad wires, etc. Internal clock is not detected. Uh, so it does not store date and time when powered off, so yeah, again, I'm thinking corrosion. Battery is okay and tested at 3.3 volts. Some shocking looking SMD IC soldering work and plenty of flux residue. All of the SMD electrolytic caps have been swapped for ceramic ones. So this is why I think it's provided this. And you know what, I would do the same thing. Uh, those little SMD uh, ceramic capacitors, they will work, but capacitors each have different, you know, the different types of capacitor have different uh, characteristics. So ceramic caps, for example, um, when they heat up, they can change the value and they can also, uh, they just behave differently in terms of the frequency, frequency, frequencies that they will filter at. Uh, and to show there's lots of different ways that they can behave subtly differently. We're not talking about major differences, we're talking about subtle differences for the for the most part. So ceramic ones, yeah, it might sound like a good, reliable, long-term thing, but yeah, I think it's better to have uh, electrolytics on there. So we'll swap those out while we're at it as well. And then he finishes off here saying the CD drive is not connected. I don't know if it works, but something I can look at after you've weaved your magic on the computer. Well, I hope so. Um, I, I've got to admit, I'm apprehensive about working on this just because it's the first time I'll have done some extensive soldering on one of these 4,000 motherboards. When I looked at these back in the day, like I say, the only time I ever saw one of these was my friend Albus. I went around to his house and he bought a brand new one and he took the lid off and let me have a little vettel around inside and... That was about it. So I've never, I've never actually worked on a 4000 before. Uh, the HD is an old drive that came with the machine, and I intend to swap it out for a compact flash system once the machine is stable and working properly. As I mentioned before, I can pay you for your time and parts. You do a fantastic job of your videos, and should not be out of pocket for any of the work you do. Keep up the great work. So that's very much appreciated. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be charging anything for this because. I'm not going to use all the flux, that's the first thing. And despite the fact I may spend several hours or more working on this, he's kindly sent me an A1200 shell, you know the brand new ones. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. It's the white, just like the original, a whitey sort of cream colour. But, if you saw previous videos, I was talking about the key replacements you can get for Amiga keyboards, and I have a white set and a black set. I originally intended to give the black set to a friend, but uh, yeah, for whatever reason, they've kind of just 
not really been in touch, you know, the keep of the distance. So, yeah, it's probably better if I just use it myself, I think. The nice thing with this Amiga kit, uh, cap kit, it's got a little cheat sheet here with the capacitor locations, the size, the quantity, uh, whether it's service mount or through hole, etc. So that's really nice. And a nice label there from uh, Amiga kit. So what we'll probably do is, I'll, when I've done it and I'm happy it's all done, I'll sign and date that or something and stamp it. But we'll stick it on the underside of the lid. Because I'm sure you don't want to see things like that on the outside of the case. Mm, I don't know, I'll ask him first. I'll ask Chris whether he wants me to do that. Because he may want to see it on the outside of the case. It makes it a bit easier, doesn't it? If you don't want to take the lid off and you can just check the back and you can see uh, who's recapped it and when. So just looking around the back here, you can see we've got the standard Amiga video port here, you know, 23 pin uh, D-type is it. So I've got my SCART cable in there, but there's no composite jack on these. Uh, left, right audio. This one here, it's a bit sloppy, so yeah, I suspect other than corrosion stuff being the cause, that might be the issue with that one. But we'll swap them out anyway, we may as well put in some brand new connectors on there. I think the gold plated the new ones, I could be wrong. And an AEC power lead here, just like you get on the 2000 stuff. So, I'll point you at the TV, we'll switch it on and just see how it's behaving. So I switch it on. So a green screen is a memory fault. It's repeatedly trying to boot there, isn't it? That's what's happening, we're getting a boot loop because of the green screen. Now the one thing I'm hoping about this, that I don't have to replace the uh, SIM sockets. Because I may need to find a, you know, a provider of those. It might not be the easiest thing to source these days. So, it would appear we're just stuck at the green screen, doesn't it? The other thing to consider here is the memory modules are here. So, it may have no memory in there. I honestly don't know. I'm guessing maybe that's why we're getting a green screen. Maybe there's no memory in there at all. So, I'll unscrew the lid and we'll fit that memory. So, I undid the two screws at the back. If we just uh, slide this back and upwards, we can lift that out of the way. Yeah, there's no memory on board, is there? So we're going to get a green screen, unless there's some uh, RAM on there, I'm pretty sure. It's curious as to why he's took the uh, memory modules out. That might be just to protect them a little bit, if there is still some corrosion around there. So I'll have to rip that on. The label's not come off very well. So I'm just going to go get my ESD wrist strap before I handle this memory. So I've got my ESD uh, wrist strap on, as you can see here. I can clip it on here because I've just checked my mains lead and it's uh, straight through to the... Uh, earth on the case here. So these are marked up handily, bank zero. Let's just get these out. Uh, bank one, bank two, bank three. So I'm thinking we might this might work with just one of the chip slot. I'm not sure there's any jumpers to configure this or whether it's intelligent enough to let's just see which way these go around because you can only get them one way. It's gonna be the other way isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be the other way. So, let's just get the one in here. You kind of just tilt these in at an angle, like that. Uh, make sure they're in, you know, you can give it a little wob wobble. And then just gently push over a little bit. That's it. That is in. Believe it or not. So the memory slots look okay here with regards to corrosion. I mean, it could have leaked underneath and stuff. You know, there could be some damage around this area here. So, now we've done that, let's just put these in here and we'll power it back on again, just see if it's any different. Well the nice thing is we haven't got that green screen. Hard disk's making an interesting noise there. Yeah, just got a black screen haven't we? Let's uh, cycle the power. I'm just going to reread his notes here about where he pressed on the board to get life out of it. So I'm trying it now without the hard disk connected, just in case it's something to do with the hard disk. Like it's maybe it's trying to boot off the hard disk and uh, it starts to boot and then fails causing some sort of issue where it's just black screens, but I don't think so. It's just a good thing to do to rule it out, I think, at this stage. Because I've been trying to power this on and off for about ooh, almost 10 minutes now, and I've pressed a little bit in the area of the board, just gently that uh, he's mentioned a few times and then you know power cycled it. 
Nope, still no different. So I'm not getting anywhere with this, uh, it's just black screen in all the time. So I think at this point I'm going to remove all the drives and things like that. So you can see I removed a screw there, I did one down the other end, just removing the uh, screws. Just remove the screws for the drive bay here and get the hard disk out. I want to have a better look at the board and maybe get a diagram. I've got uh, a couple of ROMs to substitute, kickstart with. It's only screwed on on one side that drive. Uh, disconnects the. Is that SCSI? I'm not sure. It's, it could be just IDE actually. So let's lift this bar off here. We'll take the uh, riser board out, I think. How's that screwed in? Yeah, it's just push fit, I think. So I think, imagine we've got a board down here, so oh, I need to get the CD drive out of the way, really. So very carefully uh, unclipped it there. You just got to see these little things, you've got to push them down just a little bit on one side or the other. Uh, there are eight of them in total that hold the front on. You need to be careful though, because obviously you could break them. But we can now get to the screw mounts there that hold the uh, CD drive uh, bay in I think so let's try and remove that there is uh, an 060 or an 040 uh, processor probably an 040 processor on that red PCB uh, I'll show you in a sec yeah that's all coming out now let's just put that there and as we uh, pull this forward the bar for the power thing's just fallen off there look uh, I need to disconnect the power to these drives and the uh, data well, the, the CD drive's not connected, strangely enough. Oh, good God, how are you supposed to connect that floppy drive up? That's what I want to know. It's like right under there. There we go, that's the data off. Let's try and do the power. Come on, there we go. So, let's just stick that back on top. Let's just carefully just try and pull this forward now. It should come out. There we go, thank goodness for that. Yeah, so I would say it's perhaps not as easy to work on as uh, a 2000. Uh, look at these wires here. So you can see we've got an 040 or an 060, I'm not sure which there. Um, so let's just try and move these cables out of the way a little bit. I need to disconnect that somehow now, don't I? How is that connected? It's not connected. Oh, okay, I see. It's connected here, look. Yeah, in fact, that connector's not even in. That's not even in. That wasn't even in right. That might be why it's not booting. That might be the main issue with this. It might not be the corrosion. Um, I wish these wires would just go away. Why are they hindering me so much? Well, there's one here, look, with a wire wrapped around there. Let's see if we can feed that through there. There we go. So, I mean, now we've got it like this, let's just, there we go, let's push that flat, did you see that? That went down a long way, that was not in there. So, we've got all the drives disconnected, uh, power's still there. So let's just give that a go, uh, just make sure nothing's shorting, uh, no, everything looks fine, switch it on. Let's just see if anything different happens, I mean, I saw a difference there straight away, if I'm honest, I saw like a little flicker. No, it's going to take a while because there's no uh, drives in there. Should come up with something, hopefully. Something would be nice. Well, would you believe it? Just as I stopped the camcorder there, it, it came up with uh, Workbench. You know, Kickstarter, not Workbench, Kickstarter. So, it's working. I don't think there's anything wrong with this. I think the CPU was not, uh, you know, the CPU card was not plugged in properly. I think that's what the issue was, and that explains why when it was pressing down on a certain part of the board, the power cycle of it, it might then work. It's probably come a little bit more dislodged in transit. Um, but obviously, you know, we'll do the cleanup work on this. We'll uh, take the board out, I think, clean it all up, replace the caps, uh, and then just uh, give it a test. But it would seem to be working. We'll just uh, try and uh, get the uh, CPU board out here. So I'm going to carefully, you see that, look how easy that came off. It came off super easy. That's going to be prone to bad connection, I would think. Uh, Something just fell off there then, a bit of fluff or something, it just wandered down here. Um, anyway, so there's our CPU board. Is this a replacement? Yeah, I think it kind of is. Yeah, it is, look. John Chucky Hurtle. This is a replacement one, because these, 
the, the original ones get super corroded, the caps fail on them and uh, yeah, you just end up in a mess. So this one has been uh, presumably assembled by Chucky, it might not. So I don't think you can see here, uh, MC68EC060RC50. So it's got an 060 in it, very nice. Wonder how fast this runs. Wonder if it's like 75 megahertz or faster. I mean the chip. I mean, I mean the chip here. Just looking back at the chip again. It's an RC50, so and presumably that's rated at 50 megahertz. But I do know you can overclock these a fair bit. Stephen Lear has been uh, working on uh, an 060 accelerator on uh, the Terrible Fire channel there, and he's had them running over 80 or 90 megahertz. I think 75 seems to be uh, the sort of standard frequency that people overclock these 50s to. But you can go a bit beyond it, depending on which uh, mask it is, because there's different uh, revisions of this. And a lot of these now have been faked in China as well, you know, they're redoing the, re the label on it to make it look like it's uh, a particular revision that it isn't. Yeah, I'm not that up on the 060. Yeah, and one thing I would say is I think I would clean this board up. Can you see, you know, we've got this flux, it looks a bit dirty, this looks dirty. Um, so yeah, I will clean that up as well. Uh, obviously, there's something sticky on there as well. But anyway, that is not our issue. Look at this here. Can you see it's a bit dirty? It's just flux. Loads of flux. So let's try and proceed to pull out this riser. There we go. Nice and careful. So unlike the earlier Amigas, you can see you've got two ROMs here, um, and as you can see, the mark, the handling mark there, D0 to D15, D16 to D31, because the newer models like the two, the, the 1200 and the 4000, they were 32-bit. You know, they got the AGA chips out here, 32-bit chipset, and they had uh, a 32-bit um, Zorro 3. Well, this one does Zorro 3 um, interface, you know, for the cards and things. So it's 32-bit. But when you go back to the old A500 and 600 and stuff, uh, 500 plus, they were, even the 2000, they were 16-bit processors, you know, they only had a 16-bit data bus, so you only needed one ROM, so this is why you've got two ROMs, you have what, what's called a low ROM and a high ROM. So I've got a copy of um, Chucky's DAG uh, ROM for this, but I'm not going to need it now, as things stand. Uh, anyway, that's socketed, that's interesting. And what that is, a power or something, I don't know, we'll have a look at that in a sec. So, we just need to get all of the screws out, let's just disconnect the power first. I mean, it's, it's unplugged, but let's just disconnect that, it's from there, so you squeeze the two things on the side there, can you see that? Sorry, yeah, I was off camera there. And um, we'll disconnect that. Is that IDE or is that SCSI? I'm guessing it's IDE because the 1200 uh, brought in IDE. Yeah, so, pin one was towards this side here, red line. That's okay. And it's the same with the floppy cable, it's just careful. And it's the same with the floppy cable, it's just careful to pull that out, so that's those out of the way. So, the next thing to do is to remove all these screws holding the board in. And there are a number of these, there's like three across the middle, three across either side, you know, so we've got nine screws in total there. The other thing we need to do is these uh, extend a little bit here, you know, they, they stick out from the edge, which means the board's going to struggle to come out. Uh, there's a screw here, and it looks like you can remove that to remove this little bay here. At least that's what it looks like. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, look, that's coming out. Remove that, and then it hinges out here. Can you see this little thing? Just slide it out. And we'll just continue to get the remaining screws out. Uh, look at the state of that screw, one of the screws that was on the board. That wasn't in the corrosion area, but it was originally, I think. Someone's, they've not even cleaned that up. So the next thing we need to do, I think, is free these uh, nuts up here, because this is part of the motherboard. These ones down here will just slide out the case, but this top one here is kind of held in place. Let's just see if that will start to come out. Yeah, it will. So right over the front side there, we need to just disconnect these two. Let me just see if I can work out which one's which here. So, well, the white one is at the front. Obviously, I've caught this on camera, and uh, we have a, no pin to the right hand side, so that's easy. Uh, yeah, and that said power, and the bottom one says disk, so that's okay. Just uh, move those out of the way. I can actually put, put the whole front panel piece here somewhere out of the way. So, I've got rid of all the screws, everything's disconnected. You need to carefully somehow now get it out. It's stuck a little bit there, though, so. There we go, and she's free. Uh, ESD strap on, by the way. So let's get this over to the benchmark and uh, have an inspection. 
Uh, I mean, one th crazy thing, one crazy thing I've just spotted straight away. What the hell is going on here? Look at the size of that. Is it a cap? And the, the legs, can you see there's some fractures there? Can you see that? It's not a big deal, it's just the, uh, you know, the, they've covered it in like a plastic or ceramic and it goes down the length of the legs and it's just split a bit. Someone's squidged that in there. But that is really weird. I wonder if that's the right component. Is that supposed to be fit there? I don't know, that's very strange. So you can see the SMD caps have been replaced with, uh, well, other SMD caps. They were originally SMD electrolytics, but they've used, uh, like, I don't know, ceramics or something there. Those kind of look like, uh, what are they called? Tantalums, actually. Um, you've got one here, look. Here, here, here. Uh, one down here with a crazy bit of solder strewn to it of there. So I presume there's a bad connection there. So yeah, lots of you know horrible looking uh, vias and things around there. But I mean, I do think it's working. I don't think there's a problem there. Well, but uh, having said that, there might be because I think he was having a problem with the mouse or something. I think the uh, one of the one of the uh, ports here is not working. And you can see uh, someone's previously melted that there. So yeah, we're going to swap those out anyway. So I have to admit, I'm quite nervous about working on something like this because. You know, it's it's a bit like we saw when I did that 2000. You start cleaning things up, suddenly something stops working. Because some of these connections could be on the last legs. I'm using vinegar here. I know this will have, well, you know, I expect this will have been cleaned with vinegar, vinegar in the past to uh, neutralise the alkaline there from the battery. But I have no uh, level of confidence there that that has been done. So you can see it's looking a bit green. So, yeah, there is still stuff uh, around here for sure. I'll get the toothbrush on it and have a brush around and stuff as well in a minute. But I want to clean it up first so that I can see what I'm working on here, or see what's what really, because just look at this area here, you know, there's lots of stuff, look, look at that, that's not been cleaned. Whoever did the work on this in the past did a slapdash, you know, rushed uh, job on it, which is terrible really. Because these things are super rare, well they are becoming super rare now. Corrosion is killing them. Some of these ICs have been reflowed and uh, yeah, again it looks a bit questionable. These look a bit green here. There's far too many people in a rush to just replace the caps and just, you know, ignore the, le the rest of the board effectively. You can't do that. Every single little millimetre of the board has got to be inspected and thoroughly cleaned when you've got electrolyte leakage like this. Or like this had. I mean, look at the colour of the cotton bud there. So the next thing I would do is uh, use the fiberglass pen actually on some of these components around here. Some of these caps, the tops of them are looking awful. Yeah, so let's have a little uh, wander around the board so you can see those components there. Awful caps, I'll replace those caps. I'll show you some of the cap work. Traces here, look at those. Oh. And there's these here, look. Yeah, not nice at all. Yeah, legs on these two chips here, look, they look like they've been reflowed. Uh, yeah, they're not bad, but yeah, they could be better. And then getting on towards where the battery uh, area is down here. Uh, yeah, it's not too bad, I guess. Yeah, those legs on that chip need reflown, I think. And uh, the issue with the clock might be that uh, cap, they get full of uh, corrosion and uh, that stops it from detecting the uh, clock chip. And uh, just having a look back over this side, look at those two resistors there. Ouch. Yeah, well, certainly flux needs removing from that. Yeah, and there's that, uh, whatever it is there, cap I'm guessing, I don't know. Got some more capacitors there. One there, and one here. Yeah, it's not too bad. This is the area, I think, that needs some clean-up work around here. You know, just down near the uh, audio connectors and stuff. Oh my god, this is, uh, look at this here, I'm going to show you this. Look at this here, white furry underneath the uh, CPU slot there. This is a nightmare, this board. 
I uh, honestly don't know whether I'm going to be able to repair this. I mean, it, is, it was working as you can see. If I can uh, get it back in that state at the end of it, I'll be happy. But uh, yeah, these are not easy to work on for sure. Um, I'm going to get some vinegar into here now and uh, toothbrush this whole area, I think. I wouldn't want to leave it like that. But you know, the danger with something like this, you start cleaning and uh, at something that was just barely making a conductive you know, connection suddenly is not making a conductive connection. So, uh, yeah, it's anybody's guess as to whether this will ever work again. I would certainly say you need to be really experienced to work on these boards. This is not the sort of thing you could just uh, dive into yourself if you've never done much repair work at all. Because I think, for me, I, you know, I'm nervous about this. I am nervous about this, if I'm honest. I don't really understand how that white furry stuff's got there because it's it's nowhere near anything that could leak unless this cap here leaked and ran down there. So I don't know, that's a bit weird to say the least. Anyway, that's probably about as clean as that's going to get. I'll uh, just dry it up with some cotton buds and stuff and then rinse it with and brush it with some IPA. Well, to be fair, that is looking uh, an awful lot cleaner there now. It's still a little bit damp over here, as you can see on the label. Got some muck or something there as well. I think the other thing I may do with this is test it at various stages here. So, you know, having cleaned up the things I've cleaned up, I might just temporarily reassemble it, connect to the hard disk, give it a test and just see what is going on, if anything. Uh, it'd be nice to do that for a number of reasons, certainly as I'm going along, because I can try and tackle specific problems, like the sound and the mouse, for example, uh, rather than uh, just go crazy with this, spend hours, you know, re reflowing lots of things, cleaning things up, adding changing out the caps and then find it's not doing anything at all. I'd like to just uh, minimise um, risk, you know, and you are minimising risk because you're not, not working on too many things at once and you're testing each thing as you're doing it. Um, to see what I mean? So, yeah, I think just based on this, just a little bit of clean up work I've done, you know, I did a little bit around here. You can see these pads looking a bit cleaner here. I've uh, cleaned up around here a little bit. And obviously we just wiped that connector there, cleaned all around that, brushed that. I'd like to just make sure it's still working. If it is, then I'll uh, work out what's wrong with the mouse or the sound. Deal with those, start the recap around here, retest it, and then just work my way around and keep retesting it as I'm going around. The one final thing I'll do just before I go and retest it is clean the flux off those two resistors there because it just, just looks awful. So I just tested it again and it's working uh, okay. I booted off the hard disk, I'll show you that in a minute. Well hopefully it'll still work after this. But the mouse is not working. Now the interesting thing with the mouse, because I'm using a mouse adapter to you know, a PS slash 2 mouse, the um, thing I noticed, it wasn't working at all. I looked underneath and the LED, you know, is not on the mouse. The, it's like a red light underneath when it's powered. Uh, and I wiggled the connector around and then the LED came on and then I found I didn't have horizontal, which is exactly what uh, Chris was saying. It does, you lose the horizontal. Uh, and I noticed wiggling the port seemed to make a difference. So I think we've just got a bad connection. I'll clean the uh, pins up on the uh, port in a minute. You know, get some vinegar in there and a bit of IPA and uh, give it a brush with a toothbrush. But I'm just going to reflow these. I'm removing the old solder first, and then we'll get some new solder in there. What I might do is remove this port completely if it's still problematic. We might have to swap it out. Yeah. So this 4000 is a very sick puppy. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. The sound it says missing, 
and the, the, the notes there that came with it. Uh, if you turn the volume up super loud you can hear it, but it doesn't sound right. So there's something, and can you see these sims? We're getting a memory, I thought, I connected up a floppy drive, booted uh, a game, and it uh, hung after a, a minute or two. Tried it again, same thing, I thought, there must be something else wrong with this, as well as, uh, you know, the issues we, we, we know about. So I put uh, sys test in there, tested the RAM, it failed. So I removed all the RAM apart from the chip RAM, tested it, it's okay. Stuck the first uh, sim in there, tested that, that's okay. Worked my way through these two, bank one and bank two, both of these come up with errors. Now this was as corroded as that, can you see? Look at this side here, I started to clean that side. Yeah, hopefully you can see that. Look how dull and green those pins are. So, yeah, I think this is the problem. These are going to need cleaning up for sure. Those are awful. Absolutely awful. I'll wipe them with some vinegar in a minute. This is like solder coat. It's not the, they're not gold plated or anything, these. So we can just use a bit of friction here. But it might be bad connections. Despite the fact I cleaned that one and retested it, some of them are still looking a bit questionable. So it could uh, just be a dirty contacts there. So just testing the final sim there, bank three, that's passed. Now I'm not extensively testing these, I'm just letting them go round, it so it says round two. That just shows it's gone round twice. But I'll just show you, if I remove that sim and we'll put the one in that I know is faulty, I've inspected the connections, they look super good on it. So it's a faulty uh, sim, switch it off. These are all 4 meg modules as far as I can uh, see. Well, they are, that's what it's coming up with, that's what it gets detected as. The other thing I've done here is remove the hard disk. You can hear it's powering up, it's got power to it, but I've disconnected the hard disk. That's another fault with this system. The reason you sometimes get a black screen, it's the hard disk. It's not nothing to do with the board at all. I mean, it might have been originally when that uh, CPU was not in its uh, connection properly, you know, the CPU slot. But since I've disconnected the hard disk, it boots from the floppy every time. It takes a while, I'm guessing it's looking for the hard disk. Yeah, there we go. The mouse is working at the moment, but it's in just the right position. If you move it a quarter of a millimetre, it will stop working. You'll lose the horizontal or you lose uh, power to it. So I'm guaranteeing that'll fail now. That's good news, there you go, same place. It's always these two uh, bits over here, bit one and bit two. So yeah, it's got a fault, so that's it. So I'm gonna put the other three in there and just leave that going round just to test the remainder of the RAM uh, in its entirety. So the next thing we'll do is I'll look at the sound issue. Now, I'm sorry you can't uh, see very well here, cramped in a bit of the corner here but if I just put uh, the contact on one of the ground tabs there and we just measure the uh, center pins here we should have like plus 12 minus 12 or something similar and we've got zero volts there and on this side here I can't see what I'm doing we've got zero volts on both sides of the op amp this cap here I'm guessing it might be something to do that one side of it point something volts the other side, ground, that, that's not right I don't think. This one here, 12 volts, that's going to be ground. So, it looks like we've got plus 12 around here, for some reason it's not making it here. I'm guessing it should go to one, one pin on here, and I think the minus 12 should go to the other side. Uh, this transistor here, so let me show you this, one pin there, look, 12, pin next to it, and 12, so Something's not right around here, I don't think. I don't think there should be 12 volts on each side of that. This one's got one and a half on one side, nothing on the other. I'm not sure which which of those is base collector in a bit, so we can have a look at that in a minute. Nothing there. Nothing there. So, yeah, it's uh, very unusual. So, let me show you something else strange here as well. Again, if we just put the ground down here, uh, I know that that uh, works because if I'll show you, if you just measure, see there's two resistors here, like little shunts or something. If I measure the wire there, can you see that? Minus 12. The one next to it, minus 12. Now I'm guessing that should go to these resistors. So if I look at that one there, nothing, nothing on the other side, nothing, nothing. This is a 7905, so it's a regular. So if we just look at the input there, nothing. So I'm guessing the, the 12 volts is not getting to that. 
and the output side nothing. So that's a, is it minus five? Is it, is it seven nine oh five minus five? Yeah, I think it is. We've not got minus five either. So there are a number of things going on around there, but the very fact that these two wires don't seem to lead to these as I would have thought. I mean, I can't see the PCB. It looks like the traces are gone. I suspect we need a little wire from each of those those uh, resistors. I'm going to just look at the schematics just to double check that, but that might be the answer. Um, in fact, let's just switch it off. Let's just put it on continuity test because this is a good test. Because one of the things I'll point out on the schematics, and I'll show you them in a minute, it's hard to see where the supply rails come from here. They're kind of like uh, annotated on the in, on the schematic, so you've got to look somewhere else. So if we just test continuity now from these wires here to the op amp, ah, look at that, we've got a join. So I think we've uh, worked it out pretty quick, this. Yeah, they're both on the same side, aren't they? So let's just try that again. Yeah, both those two little wires there go the same way. Um, so with regards to the other side, I'm not sure where that goes. Oh, it's ground. So, or is it? It's a resistance, like 0 0.42. Yeah, I know you can't see the uh, meter here, but I just want to just measure that there. Yeah, minus 12. So, uh, that's a bit strange as well, actually. I wouldn't expect 0 on one side and minus 12 on the other. Anyway, we do have an issue here. So, I need to see, see where these are on the schematics. So the piece of trace here was literally broken off, that's why I couldn't get a continuity test from here. We do have scratched a little bit of the copper off there. So now when I zoom in, it's much clearer here. I can see that there is a trace missing from here to this, and it's the same over here. There is big, large pieces of trace missing. I'm amazed that those uh, resistors are so well adhered. You know, you can't move them, they're stuck down. What they're stuck down to, I don't know. It must be the remainder of the pads underneath them. Um, yeah, I'm really glad he sent me some new flux because I'm going to open one of those tubes in a minute. But anyway, if we just get a little bit uh, down here on there, and note there's a cap missing here. Can you see that? So I'm going to look at the schematics in a minute and work out what that is because that looks like that's been removed. That should be there. And a little bit on uh, these uh, resistor sides there. So we're making a mess, but it doesn't really matter too much at this stage. Um, not really sure of a nice easy way to do this because we need to get to the components so the wires are going to have to be on this side. Let's just add a little bit of uh, solder to that uh, trace if we can. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and let's just uh, see if we can reflow this side of these. Yeah, we can. So we're going to be able to join a wire up there pretty easily. Let's uh, get a little bit more solder. Let's see if we can see these vines. Can't see the blooming things. Yeah, a little bit on that one. A little bit of that one. Uh, and let's just uh, reflow this side. Of these as well. Yeah, those resistors are really well holding in place, so the pads on the, underneath them are okay. And what I'm going to try and do here, and I might have to do this off camera, is heat the via and push the k into it if I can. I might need to do it under magnification because I'm not sure I'm going to be able to see what I'm doing. Yeah, that's in there. I just want to flatten it a little bit. And uh, pull it. It's almost flush. Well, pretty much flush with that uh, end of that resistor there. And trim it. So, yeah. I don't really like doing this kind of uh, thing, to be honest. There's just no other way to do it. You do need to get onto the uh, resistor. You know, there's, it's not like you can solder the wires from the underside and make it look clean and presentable. There's no option. So, now we've done that, I'm going to get flux all over my hands now. Let's just squish that down like that. And then just uh, 
Right, let's try and make it flat, totally. There we go. So I don't know if you can see that, that wire is totally flat there. And if we just add a bit of solid and flux to this point here, it might bulk out a little bit more than we would like, but I just want to get a reliable connection there to that. So I don't know whether that's going to be enough. I'll uh, test on continuity, but I'll do the same with the one next to it there. And then I'll do the same with uh, down here, you know, from that little bit of a trace there to each of those two. So, there we go. You know, we've got a joint to the wire there, joint to the wire there. These two are joined together with a strand of wire there. Now, technically, I could have made that a little bit tidier. I might re redo that. Well, I just want to test it, really. I might just join from here to here, just with a single bit of exposed wire. The thing is, if you try and have sleeving on it, that bit of that gap there is so small, you'd have a, an exposed bit of wire. I mean, we've got an exposed bit of wire joining the two up there. The only other alternative is to have two wires, but I don't know, I think that looks alright. We'll just get some uh, IPA on there, toothbrush around, I'll do some connectivity tests, just to make sure I'm happy that that's all correct. And then we'll go test it and see if the sound has improved at all. Get the toothbrush onto it as well in a sec. So you could argue, yeah, it doesn't look uh, that tidy, but you know, that's about as tidy as that's going to get. When you've got that amount of damage around there, what are you going to do, really? You could start using copper tape to replace the traces and things like that. Um, as I say, if there were contacts to these components that went to wires, I could you know mount on the underside these wires. But there's no there's no fix really. There's no solution. You've got to do something like this with some fixed wires on the top side here. So I'll just get a bit of uh, IPA and a toothbrush, and then we'll test connectivity. Here we go, Mr. Brushy. So we'll just brushy, brushy, brushy around there. One or two of these ICs around here are going to get reflowed anyway. I mean, this one here is not so bad, but there are one or two that have been reflowed previously and they just look a bit crusty. So I'll clean up around here with cotton buds again. Yeah, and I did say cotton buds, plural. Uh, I'm going to hands here, look. So you know what? As fudgy as that looks, that don't look bad actually. The main thing is, does it work? So meter on continuity test, let's see what's going on now. So these two should be joined together, those two should be joined together. That's correct. Uh, this side here should go to the diode, I think. Yeah. And the side over here, these should go to pin two. Yeah, that's it. Pin one is ground. Let's just test that. Hang on, where's ground gone? Oh, sorry, pin one's ground. And pin three should go to the op amp, I think. Oh, hang on, no, it doesn't. Pin three is minus five. Pin two, which goes here, that should go to the op amp. And it does. You can't see where I'm probing, but I'm probing. Yeah, I'll show you where I'm probing there. Pin 2 from the middle of that regulator, which is the 12 volt, uh, minus 12, I think, goes to that top pin there. The one on the other side, it goes to ground, I think. Is it ground? In fact, it doesn't. Where does the one on the other side go? Yeah, I would expect the one on the other side goes to plus 12. Uh, so maybe we've got an issue with the plus 12 on this as well. So there we go, booted up. Uh, I've lost one direction on the mouse. Let's just move the connector a little bit. Yeah, it's super annoying that mouse connector. There we go. I've worked out if you twist it a certain way, it starts to work. So if we go into audio, how we do? Yeah, we still haven't sorted it completely because it's still very quiet in my mind. It's a lot better. Yeah, if I turn the volume up, you'll be able to hear the filter work in there. So that's filter off, filter on. But I can hear some audio noise in the background, and it's still not very uh, loud. 
actually. Yeah, normally the volume on 20 something would be quite loud. But it's not. Around that level there, that should be relatively audible. And it isn't. So we still haven't completely fixed this yet. So if we just uh, measure around here and I'll show you, we've got uh, the voltage problems again. So the, the 7805 here, uh, sorry, 7905, you can see it's output on pin 3. Hopefully you can see full light there, minus 5. It's middle pins, obviously, minus, minus 12 that goes in. Uh, we've got here, minus 12, minus 12, minus 12, minus 12. Uh, on the op amp down here, it's bottom supply pin there plus 12 so it's got his plus 12 now you would expect the minus 12 I'm sure I tested connectivity on this a minute ago we've not got anything so maybe a trace to that has burnt out or something there's something else going on around here that means this has only got half its supply rail the other side's uh, you know zero volts uh, which kind of explains why it's about 50% as loud as it should be but the fact we've got one of the voltages there um, <sighs> The strange thing is, I'm sure we've only just dealt with the minus 12, so how the hell we got plus 12 back here a minute ago? Uh, well, now, if I show you, we've got definitely got plus 12 on the, the bottom pin there. Hang on, get in the right place. Hang on, this plus 12's gone now. The other thing I'd point out here is it sounds a bit weird. That sounds alright, but you can hear like a some high frequencies in the background, like maybe the filtering's not right or something. Sounds a bit twangy. Yeah, and I found it freezes here at this point. Is this my disc? I'm testing it now just with chip RAM. So, something strange there as well with this, uh, with respect to this particular game. So, just trying to measure around again. I've just noticed something here. I just I can see it from the angle I'm at here. There's a crack in that cap there. I can feel it. That ceramic cap has uh, fractured. Somebody's uh, cracked that at some point in the past. That might be why it sounds twangy and strange, but that isn't why we are getting, uh, you know, still not getting the volume properly. So I need to work out what component that is. Um, I can just about see the cap number there and find a replacement for that. But just measuring the voltage, I appreciate you can't see the meter, but I'm definitely getting 12 volts there. I see that on the meter, but up here I'm seeing zero, like 0.1 of a volt. Now the interesting thing is, if I just switch this off, and uh, test continuity so I've widened the shot a little bit there so you can see so if we measure from this this pin here that was zero volts to here I've got a join now it's not a dead short it's like 0 0.053 on that side and on that side 0 0.046 so there's a, a resistor or a ferrite bead or something in between these what I don't understand is why on here it's zero volts but here it's not we're getting a drop, a voltage drop, where it's pulling it to zero. Now this isn't getting warm, so it's not like that's sucking it all up. So there is something else, even though we seem to have a connectivity here, there's something else on the route from the minus 12 to this side here that means this side is not getting uh, minus 12. Uh, and I'm guessing, I'm just guessing it should have minus 12, because that's the way the other Amiga seems to be. You have plus 12 on one side, minus 12 on the other. Um, Anyway, I'll have a look at that cap and then just get specs around here, see if we can work out what is going on. I might need to test from connectivity here to some of these components around, and wires and things around here to see if we can work out what's going on on the route from here to uh, here. So I think the next thing I'm going to do is clean up around here. These need straightening. The, the solder points are awful on them. The transistors look alright. Um, these caps are going to be replaced in a way, but I need to remove this one. Uh, I might just remove these anyway and replace these while I'm here in this area. Um, but I'm going to try and uh, I'll get a bit of flux on here, a bit of solder, this solder braid, and just uh, you know the solder tin over these here because they're just a bit exposed. There's the odd thing that's exposed around here. Um, the uh, twelve, the, the connection here that was a low resistance, not quite short to the uh, minus twelve. It comes up here, 
So this is soldered on the other side, there's a blob of solder on the other side of that fire. So if I solder this one as well, hopefully we'll get, I mean there is a dead short between the two, but hopefully that might fix it. We might need to remove this, but I'll reflow this anyway. Look at this one here, look how crusty a line that is. So I'll get the hot air and just tweak that in position, get some flux and reflow that as well. Uh, reflow some of these while we're here as well. Um, but beyond that, um, yeah, I mean that's not going to be causing the voltage problem, that is uh, probably making it sound a bit odd. You know, like I say, the filtering is not quite right. It's not got the normal filtering characteristics going on with uh, that cap like that. And it is a fracture right across there. So I'll remove this damaged cap here first, I think. We'll just uh, heat each side of that. I'm at 420 at the moment, actually. It's a bit high, but that's probably what you need to work on boards like this. It kind of reminds me of the Neo Geo in many ways, this board. Certainly got the same sort of thickness traces. Be interested to see whether this does break into two pieces or whether it's going to uh, just be a, a crack on the surface. Quite large pads on that though, so it's, uh, it's taking a while to get up to temperature that. Well, it is in one piece, so maybe it's not uh, completely uh, fractured. Anyway, we'll just take that off for the moment. I can put it back on in a minute if it's alright. Just move over there. Uh, so the next thing, so the next thing I want to do is uh, just heat this transistor here, uh, and just reposition it, and then I can reflow it with some uh, chip quick flux. There we go. That's moving already. That. Just going to inspect that. So I've just started uh, removing these uh, ceramic uh, caps. Actually, uh, I think that's one of them. There kind of looks like it. So if we just heat both sides, there we go. That's that one off. This one here is one. Coming off pretty easy, these actually. Now, you could argue it might be a good idea to leave these on there because you know, wet type electrolytics uh, may eventually leak again. Um, these ones are like tantalums, aren't they? The legs on those are super hard to get to. This could be quite fiddly to remove this one. Right next to that three pin connector there as well. I can always replace it if I melt it. It's coming off I think. There we go. Yeah that was quite loosely fitted there. It might be a consequence of having a too large a physical profile for what should be there. There we go. Is there any more around there? No, I think that's that immediate area, so we can clean up the pads and things around there, clean up, turn up the traces, and then we'll fit the proper caps that should be in that area. I will have to order the one for the, the broken or fractured ceramic. So I'll just uh, mop up that with the uh, solder braid. Oh, I'm out of the solder braid, oh no. I think I might have uh, a spare or two somewhere. Pads are in not bad condition actually, that's a pleasant surprise. So I'm sorry I can't show you everything here, but what I can do is just show you a few bits like reflowing that uh, op amp there. I'll do the same on the other side. Uh, I'll do one of these transistors just to you know, show you, you've got the flux on there already. Just heat the uh, single point there, get a little bead of solder like that. Look. Looks nice, uh, and then the same on the uh, two points on that side of it. It's looking so much better already. And um, we'll do the one up here that I can't really see. Got to be careful with the iron because you know you can see that's been touched there previously. I don't think it was me that did that. Let's get that point there. 
I'll have to come around the other side to get that uh, one on the other side. Yeah, that's that one. I'll have to try and get the iron around this side. Uh, just reflow that one. So after a clean up and a bit of a tin, you know, you can see I've tinned some of the questionable wires and things around here, reflowed, 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 reflowed all sorts of things around here. Uh, it's looking super tidy. So the next thing I'm going to do is get the caps back on. The first one is this one here, which I think is, it says there, C404. Uh, there's nothing else there, it could be, that one's that one there, C403. So C404 must be this, and according to the Amiga Kit kit, uh, that's one of the B type caps. So yeah, I'll just get it in position. Uh, I've shown you this stuff before. Hold it down. I'll probably show you when I do it. Just hold it down, solder one side, then solder the other side. Add a little bit of flux just to reflow them to make it look nice and tidy. So I'll just get a little bit of uh, solder on the iron. I'll add the flux in a minute and reflow it. And uh, we just want to just carefully oh, try and do this without moving it. Just press it down in the middle and just solder the one point like that. Just touch it. Yeah, stable. So let's try the other side. Add a little bit of uh, solder to the uh, to oh, super fiddly trying to do this on camera. Yeah, you can see that's joined. I'm going to get some uh, flux on there just to flow that. So I'll show you another one of these uh, while I do it. So I just get some solder on there. Going to need to come at a weird angle here. Just hold it down. Oh, it's not flowing. Um, just hold it down and uh, flow that one side. That's it. And that's that side. Hopefully you can uh, start to see the difference there. It's looking so much better, that area. It really is. I didn't think I was going to be able to get that looking uh, so good actually. Just because the borders uh, have been in such a state. Wow, well, listen how much louder that is now. It's not right. Let me turn it down. That's correct now, that volume level wise. So all the work I've just done around there was uh, essential. But it sounds a little bit weird. Let me just reset it so you can hear what I mean at the start. It sounds very strange. Can you hear that rumbling? Let's turn it down a bit. Again, it's sounding very twangy. That room? Room? We've got the volume anyway, that's the main thing. So I'm going to go look up the size of that cap now and order one of those. So something I am aware of and had completely forgotten about, the audio coupling caps on this, the uh, silk screen, may be wrong. So we might need to swap, uh, I don't know which ones it is, 22s I think, somewhere around here, uh, around. Uh, I'm not too worried about that at the moment because we're just testing for very short periods of time and bear in mind the uh, all shipped from the factory with them the wrong way around so just for the few minutes I'm testing trying to work out what's going on with the audio here it's not a big deal we can uh, swap them around in a minute so sorry I had to bring the video to an abrupt end there just because there's again it's uh, one of these where there's so much footage the video would be like uh, two or maybe three hours long in the next part I'll deal with the uh, remaining uh, well most of the sound issues there's a missing, well, a low voltage level on t one side of the op amp. I'm not sure if that's something that uh, followed after me uh, having done the reflow and stuff. You just saw me do there, tidying it all up. Uh, ultimately, there is a, a fault, you know, faulty component around there. But uh, the sound, even though I'm at the end of this series now, you know, you don't, you can't see the state the board is in at the moment. It's, it's pretty much perfect. Everything I need to do to that board has been done. As far as I'm con concerned, I think it's ready to go back. But there's two issues. One of them is Aladdin. You know the singing part of the intro to Aladdin? It kind of sounds uh, bitty, 
almost as if it's these little gaps in timing between the parts of the sample that are being played, but the rest of the sound sounds normal. The other things that I've pointed out in this video, you know, remember I said it sounds a bit twangy? It does, it sounds a little bit like the high frequency stuff is more noticeable. Now that could be because there's, uh, someone pointed out there's an additional butter with filter um, on the uh, A4000 and I think it's on the 1200 as well but I've never noticed it before it does sound a little bit twangy but as you'll see in the next video I've tested all of the connectivity around the audio section there is nothing faulty there I'm going to double check it again next but my question to you is if you've got a 4000 with an 060 what happens in June at the start the wind noise there's normally a wind noise is the first part of that intro music and it sounds kind of like a rumble or it's distorted a little bit crackly but every other aspect of it is fine apart from you know as i say it sounds a bit twangy and the other thing is on aladdin like i say that voice breaking up on the intro a little bit it's a bit strange but i can't help but wonder if it's the 060 because you know what as you'll see in the next video when i do the remaining things that need to be done to this board every game i've tested on it sounds normal and sounds perfect, no issues whatsoever. So it's, it's a bit of a mystery. I, I'm putting it down to the 060, but I'd feel a lot happier if I came across someone who's got had that same experience with uh, an 060. And before I forget, have a fantastic Christmas and a happy 2020. Thank you very much to all my subscribers, my patrons, um, friends and family for helping support me uh, through this year. It's, uh, you know, back end of this year has been quite tough, but it's looking like it's gonna be perhaps a positive 2020. Thanks for watching, I'll catch you in the next video.